With this said, however, let's go back to our basis and start with talking about systemic therapy because understandably uh, for all of us, uh, for the last 11 years or so, we started with uh, one trial that was reported at that time, Sorafnib, a multi-TKI that was uh, actually in the early days uh, when uh, uh, our group at Sloan Kettering uh, led the first effort back in the uh, beginning like 2000, uh, in the 2000s. It was not even understood to be antiangiogenic, but nonetheless we got it at that point and we show uh, great results um, that uh, promised enough that we'll go for a phase three trial that did uh, actually randomized patient to sorafenib versus placebo in first line for HCC. And the trial was positive. It showed an improvement in survival that really was close to about 11 months in regard to the sorafenib versus the placebo. It was statistically and clinically significant and became the standard of care in no time in 2007. For 10 years or so, we tried everything under the sun to try to see how can we make it better, either by doing other drugs or even try to combine it with other drugs, and nothing worked. And really, we were left in a very easy field where sorafenib is the only standard of care that, for to some extent, we were uh, satisfied with, but of course, it also were dissatisfied with in regard to adverse events or in regard to what can it lead to because there were no responses, but nonetheless, people did survive longer. And then out of nothing, our colleagues in Japan come with a drug called lenvatinib. So let's see. Dr. Kudo, tell us, <laughs> what, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Japan, after the trial, the, the lenvatinib was approved in uh, uh, March 23. And uh, <clears throat> already more than 1,300 patients, patients, the lenvatinib was prescribed. So that, that's a more, more patient than uh, regolafin prescribed for two, two months. So currently, uh, uh, first-line treatment option is uh, lembatinib uh, seems uh, replacing the solafin right now. Because, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. because of uh, the uh, Japanese patients, uh, uh, more frequent uh, hand foot skin re syndrome, and uh, the elderly patient, there are elderly patients, and uh, the body weight is uh, uh, light, so less than 60 kilogram patients are more frequent. So the we uh, in in real world uh, setting, we prescribe the patients; they do not complain um, almost nothing. So the not very. Because we are used to the uh, management of hand for skin reaction for sorafenib or other AEs related TKI, so it is very easy to manage, and uh, and uh, so it's a uh, uh, reflect trial to show uh, and response that the two week we. Uh, see the patients every week for one month and every two weeks. But uh, two weeks later, the AFP value drops. Uh, of course, the responders drops uh, dramatically. Uh, not dramatically, but uh, the significant drop. And then we take a CT scan. The two weeks, only two weeks, the uh, tumor became necrotic or uh, low dense change. So uh, we can see the response and the uh, patients is patients are happy and the uh, physicians also happy and to continue the uh, lembatinib so it's a very different in the uh, from uh, solafenib no doubt that we're all happy to see the data but uh, uh, rich uh, here in the u.s and understandably probably anywhere also People will ask us about the design of that study and the outcome of that study. So can you get, take us through the sure. design and the statistical design as well as the outcomes? Yeah, that's an important question because up to this time, we had about five randomized studies in the frontline setting and they were all negative. Uh, this is the first phase three study to meet its primary endpoint, which was non-inferiority. So first, if we talk about lenvantinib versus serafinib, obviously they're both small molecules, uh, multi-kinase inhibitors. Uh, Lenvantinib does have a very potent pan-VEGF receptor uh, profile, but also hits the fibroblast growth factor receptor family very well. FGFs 1 through 4, which we know are important in proliferation, 
as well as maybe angiogenesis resistance. And in the design of this study, they took patients like others that were trial PUA, uh, good performance status, uh, that had not been treated in the front line. They excluded some patients that hadn't traditionally been excluded from other studies, uh, such as patients who had more than 50% of their liver involved, or invasion of the main portal vein branch. So we know that liver cancer likes to grow into the vasculature. And when we do imaging and we see that, that's called macrovascular invasion. It's macrovascular because we can see it on a scan. And often, deep in the liver, you'll see a tumor invading a branch. But in this study, they excluded patients where that tumor is growing into the main portal vein, so outside of the liver. And again, historical studies didn't exclude those patients. And the guidelines from Japan would indicate that these patients shouldn't be treated with serafinib. And that became the basis for the design. Patients were stratified as typically by region, uh, extrapatic spread or macrovascular invasion, their performance status, and by weight. Again, unique to this study and unique to the dosing of lenvantinib is its dose by weight. This greater or less than 60 kilos, 12 milligrams versus 8 milligrams, which I'll remind everybody is much less than the approved doses in thyroid cancer and kidney cancer, which are 24 milligrams. So this study randomized about 950 patients in an open label fashion. So several things to discuss about the design, to serafinib or lenvantinib with the primary endpoint being non-inferiority. And if the non-inferiority endpoint was met, then to look at superiority and other secondary endpoints. And as we know, the study met its endpoint. Median OS went from about 12.3 months to 13.6 months with lenvantinib. That was a hazard ratio of about 0.92. And the upper limit of the hazard ratio was 1.06. That was below the cutoff of 1.08 to declare non-inferiority. We've seen in some of the radioembolization studies, for example, that the curves overlap, but those studies were designed for superiority. So they're negative studies. And the upper limit of the hazard ratio in some of those studies is 1.43. So very, very wide. This study was designed to come up with a hazard ratio that was fairly tight in that if we are under 1.08, we can say with very high confidence that these drugs have an equivalent effect on overall survival. So this is very important that you bring up a, a, a concept which is rather we all hear about it, know about it, but not necessarily understand it fully, which is the non-inferiority, which means, in other words, the aim of the study was not really to look if one drug is better than the other. It was really the purpose and the uh, objective was to look if they are equal. And as such, you cannot answer a superiority question. But nonetheless, as we heard from Dr. Feng, is that if anything, uh, the... The uh, fascinating part is that the hazard ratio cut off on the top level of the non-inferiority was actually very close to where the superiority would have uh, start kicking in. It was 1.06, and if anything, the cutoff was 1.08. In other words, anything which is above the 108 would have been a superior study. And this is, it's, it's, it's fascinating that we were really very close to really make it even superior.